clean up, but what can they say? Oh my gosh, they're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of a sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and we're kicking off 2022 with a show about 2021. Joining me for this highlight show is Dan. How are we, Dan? I'm, uh, I'm great, thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. And Dan, let's kick off uh, very quickly talking about your, your fundraiser, trying to get you to Colombia because we've had enough of you here in the UK. As we talk, it is the 2nd of January, half past three. Where are we at with the fundraiser? And what uh, are you looking for still? So we are up to 1,078, which is incredible. Uh, we're looking for 1,500. Uh, it would just help me cover the cost of getting there, the accommodation, and, and you know, help and investigate the, the phenomena that's on that mountain. Awesome. Now, you've probably heard in the announcement show or seen on social media what we're doing and why. The description for that will again be in the link for this show. People have been incredibly generous. And listen, we're always honest and we are very aware that uh, as part of the podcast, Dan's just helped raise a huge amount of money for two charities. And we're going out at a really difficult time of year and asking people to to help us send Dan to a, a beautiful South American country for, for a week or so to, to investigate the phenomenon, which as much as he's going to love to do that, he is representing people like yourselves that want uh, to do that kind of stuff but you know not everyone can get there it's a lot of money and it came up very last minute which is why we're, we're having to do this so it's a uh, huge hugely appreciated for anyone who has managed to donate and if you haven't even just sharing the link or liking it would be would be much appreciated at this time but i think we're, we're both pretty amazed dan how quickly that the the money seems to have racked up yeah, it's incredible. People have been so supportive. I'm I'm so blessed and, and humbled by it. Um, but like you say, it's it's to go and make a documentary to investigate the phenomena and share what we find there. Um, you know, we'll get to it later talking about what what I feel about Biden signing the bill this year. But um, but I feel it's a starting gun for stuff like this to happen. Yeah, and the Ashley Kerry interview that comes out in the next couple of hours will be available. Uh, and we do talk to Ashley, who is making the documentary, about the project, what it hopes to achieve, why people like Dan should be involved. Um, so hopefully you can listen to that and that will give you even more uh, of an emphasis or understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. So please check that one out with Ashley Kerry. But anyway, listen, Dan, we're into 2022. It's a couple of days old. There have been no new pandemics or anything yet. Uh, that's always a good sign. However, 2021, there were there were quite a few highlights when it came to UFOs. Um, a regular conversation, or I don't want to say argument, but debate you have online with people, is that there's nothing happening and there's been no news and no new videos since 2017, 2018, and everything seems to have slowed down. And that's not the case. I mean, we we done one of the KGRA shows based on political statements from, from just a couple of years to show where politicians had come from and where they were now in terms of talking about the UFO subject on the mainstream media and all that kind of stuff. And I think that opened up a lot of, pe lot of people's eyes that when you take a step back and look at a timeline of events, you go, wow, a lot has happened. And 2021 was no different to that. What I done was put out onto the Patreon to ask people to submit their own highlights for 2021 just to give us a frame to to talk about some things as well and people were fantastic in getting in touch so we've picked some of those to discuss as part of this highlights package and what we'll do is we'll finish off talking about what we hope for in 2022 when it comes to ufos so we'll kick off dan with matt and matt said probably one of the most obvious ones but it's got to be up there definitely format the Gillibrand amendment he's been waiting 42 years for this Dan it seems like a really obvious one but it's it's got to be up there I suppose in a top two or three doesn't it yeah absolutely it's resulted in the first congressional mandate on UAP or UFOs in history it's a big 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 deal and we're seeing a bit of arm wrestling now from the DOD over it um and you you can kind of feel them sweating I think 
Now, this is a good chance actually to clear up something. A couple of days ago, Roger Glassell, who writes and comments on on the UFO subject as well, um, had mentioned on Twitter that he had emailed Susan Goh, who mentioned that the AOI MSG would be fully compliant. That's not the exact word, was it? But I'm sure you can find it for us, Dan, with the, the NDAA requirements and roger took this to mean that there'd be no ufo office it would be taken over by the aoi msg and again i'm coming from a place where i'm no expert in this especially in foreign you know politics and exopolitics but that's not how i read susan goes statement all i saw she was saying to him was quite generic and basically that the office that would be created under aoi msg or what they would be doing would be would be in, in a way regulated by the NDAA and that was it it didn't say anything to me that that would be the UFO office going forward and that's how you took it as well wasn't it yeah 100% you, you know you you read um, I've got the statement here if you'd like me to read yeah it go out. for it, it please it's not yeah. too long it just says uh, Su- Susan says Roger the department will take necessary steps to comply with any enacted legislation on November 23rd Deputy Secretary Hicks established the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group and the Airborne Object Identification and Management Executive Council to provide oversight. As you may recall, we've been, we've been developing implementing guidance for the AOI MSG. We're now working with the ODNI on the implementing guidance to ensure that the AOI MSG meets congressional intent. We have nothing else to announce at this time. That phrase there, congressional intent, is really important because the intent of the Gillibrand Amendment is to have oversight of this investigation. If the AOI MSG kind of if that became the office, there is not really any oversight away from the people who have kept this, you, you know, in a dark cupboard for the past God knows how long anyway, and has been messing it up. Um, so I, I don't think that it fits the congressional mandate. And it kind of needs a complete overhaul, including where it is in the government organization to even begin to meet the congressional you know, uh, requirements. So, you know, just make a new office and give it a different name. Astro is pretty good. Yeah. Now, the way I kind of commented on it at the time was like, imagine that the the US government was going to start, you know, a parcel delivery service, but another branch within the US government decided oh, they were going to have a delivery service too. They would still have to adhere to the, the US government's mandate and the rules for parcel delivery. If the US government then decided as part of an amendment, this is going to be the main office and this is what we want to to look after parcel delivery and deliver parcels. It doesn't mean that there couldn't be another delivery service, but they would all just have to adhere to the same rules. One might completely gazump the other though. So I hope that analogy made sense. But that's yeah, yeah, what I was kind of saying on the spot to, to, to Roger Glassell that it doesn't seem like the two can't exist together, but it seems a little bit pointless. And I suppose there's a little bit of posturing there, isn't there, that for the AOI MSG to suddenly announce, do you know what, actually, okay, fair enough, we'll we'll totally dissolve before we've even got going, and we'll just leave this to the to the Gillibrand Amendment in the office that may end up being Astro or, or something along those lines. I don't think they're going to do that yet, are they? Because the whole idea is they're still trying to wrestle some sort of control of this subject and office away from from where it should rightly sit. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, you, you know, listeners might not know, because uh, it's the kind of thing we post on Twitter and we talk about over there. Um, but Susan Goff, the, the spokesperson for the Department of Defense, um, which is a new title, by the way, she actually wrote a paper in 2003 called The Evolution of Strategic Influence, um, basically how to PSYOP and the history of PSYOPs. Um, Susan is very well studied in this area. Um, I'd recommend just Google that title, The Evolution of Strategic Influence, and it'll come up and you can have a flick through. Um, but you'll see that she is essentially saying that PSYOPs aren't a bad thing and that kind of centralizing control is actually real helpful. It wasn't long after that that she took control of the UAP communications for the DOD. Um, and rather than, you know, being kicked out on a butt for undermining the FOIA process, she has been given seemingly a promotion to the Department of Defense spokesperson. So she's gone from one department to a full umbrella so this is even more reason for me that it needs to be outside of that umbrella, just because the, these people are playing games. Susan know what she, knows what she's doing, and I feel like Roger, I'm going to use a strong word here, Roger spread a little propaganda there to muddy the waters, and I bet Susan was happy about it. Yeah, and whether it was the case or not, I, I don't know Roger, I know him that well at all, and I know what you're saying, but 
it just seems like if you are going to jump on a statement like that and push it out as, well, this is the fact because it's an interpretation, then you've probably got your own leanings and an agenda in yeah. terms of the subject anyway, and you're just fitting a rather vague commentary into your own agenda to say, well, this is what this means, so no news here. And yeah. that's that's not the way to look at that because it was very politician it was very vague it was very generic and didn't really say a whole our friend graham rendell commented it was one of those statements where it says a whole lot without saying anything at all um yeah 100 percent. It, it it sounds like a a statement from a losing football manager as the other team are doing the dance in the end zone yeah it's the whole we go again next week for for football fans i'll know that one <laughs> um but yeah no listen gillibrand amendment is something that's going to play a big part in this year and i'm sure later at the end of the pod when we talk about what we're looking forward to this year dan's going to bring up a few dates and uh, that we can look forward to on the calendars as well that will no doubt have that as an involvement joe was next up and joe said for me there were a few highlights and i've got to give joe yeah absolute props for his first one ross coulthart's book and the fact that it convinced my friends uh, and myself of many aspects of the phenomenon. I, I will add to that, Joe, not just the book, but the documentary Ross Dunn um, was a fantastic piece for for those outside of, of the UFO community because it really has had an impact on the mainstream as well, to the point that Channel 7 that produced it allowed the, the recent follow-up to be made as well, which was a mishmash of the original with some updated commentary within that as well. Um, and I, when I get to my kind of highlights, I've got I've got Ross in there as part of that because I think if Ross Coulthart himself, as a mainstream journalist who's done some pretty hard hitting stories and, and big pieces, even now outside of UFOs, has come into the subject in a big way, and that can only help push this conversation forward. Dan, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, you, you know the the name of the game is to like we we know these things are out there. You know, we've got the paperwork to prove the conspiracy. Even John Greenwald from Black Vault admits, you, you know, we'll, we'll back you on the statement of we can prove the conspiracy. That's the easiest part of all this. Um, so more journalists coming on board and digging into this and showing that it's real will just prompt more journalists to come on board. I have a feeling that sometime through the next year, we're, we're going to be seeing, you know, a few maybe kind of media outlets that we've noted are missing. I feel like they've been working in the background this whole time, getting something ready. You know, I, I don't think they're going to just dump 10 minute pieces. It's going to be, we'll, we'll see some kind of somber look here. Well, it's worth mentioning that as we talk last night on Channel 5 in the UK, and to be fair, Channel 5 is not a bastion of uh, news excellence or or commentary for society. It's got some pretty questionable shows that, that it puts out as trash TV. However, it showed a, a UFO documentary last night that I caught a couple of minutes of it. I've still to watch it, but I look at our friend, you know, Adam Goldsack as someone who is probably pretty hard to please in this subject. And he himself said it was quite good. So it seems that it struck a relatively decent tone. I saw just a couple of minutes of it that had Kevin Day and they were talking about the, the Nimitz event. And yeah, from what I saw, I was like, yep, fair enough. And there was a few things I said as I, I was kind of standing watching it uh, and my wife had it on, which was great to see. She was watching a UFO documentary when I wasn't there. I was busy editing an interview. Um, I said, oh, they've not mentioned this. And then within a few seconds, they mentioned the point I just made. And I was like, ah, okay, cool. So it, I've, I've got to give them props that it seems like they've done a decent job of it. Um yeah, and it, that it, would be a very good sign that we've got a UFO documentary being put out in the UK that's not all lol, aliens, flying saucers, little green men. It, it was a hell of a lot better than J.J. Abrams' effort, I'll say that. Um, it was actually a somber look at it. It had a lot of the same people, but it didn't use the editing in the same way. It more presented the mystery and said, what is this? Um, usually when things get to the limits, now, you know, we, we've seen it so many times in documentaries that I get a bit like, oh, okay, you know, it's kind of fun seeing how they represent it, but we know the story. Um, but right after the limits, they did something unexpected. And and usually, you know, that's where we go to the school landings or we go into the Men in Black stuff. They actually went to Hestalen and spoke about the Hestalen lights and how anomalous they were. So it wasn't just, oh, hey, you know, this might have been ball lightning out there. Um, it was more there's there's a bona fide mystery here and there were a lot of similarities between these two things and scientists have been trying to study it but the funding isn't there and 
you know, that that's an excellent point coming into the year after, you know, Galileo and everything. They're, they're starting to receive money to, to actually start these research initiatives. Joe mentioned a few more. Um, the next up, he said Lou Elizondo's interview with Kurt Jai Mungo, or he said interviews, um, of which Lou done a couple, which were very good, but his um, two and a half hour longest ever Lou Elizondo interview was was really great. And again, this is something I mentioned Kurt in with my highlights of the year, and I'll get to that later, but he got a lot out of Lou in a really long form conversation, but I would I would bite your hand off for for even half of that time with Lou, which is hard to get. But it was great someone like Kurt got that time and was able to ask the questions that he was asking. So I, I'm I'm totally with him on that one. Dan, you asked did you ask a question within that? You were in the live chat, I weren't you? I did. There, there was actually a, a a portion where, you know, I wish I could frame it and put it on my wall like one of those moving Harry Potter pictures. Um <laughs> I asked my question and, and Lou kind of caved and was like, yeah, I know what he's doing. He's trying to pull some information out of me for people. And he gave me a nice big compliment. And that that was actually one of the highlights of my year. <laughs> I don't blame you. But yeah, um, Kurt will come up again later on. Um, a few more from Joe. The publication of Children of Orion by Ryan Musgrave Evans. Uh, he thinks they'll be seen as more significant in the future. Not one I've seen or heard of, but I'll check that out. Um, the Reading of Chains of the Sea by the Paranormal Blip podcast on the recommendation of Lou Elizondo. Change of the Sea, Dan. Uh, we've touched on this a few times, but I still see it come up in, in various um, chats and it happened on Patreon, on the Discord, and I've seen it on Twitter as well. I've got my copy of Change of the Sea here. Is it something that at this point people look too much into because of a comment Lou made about it just being an interesting book, but everyone's jumped on it as if it's some secret message within it? Or am I wrong? I, I would agree with you. Uh, it was a book that was recommended to Lou by Douglas Dean Johnson. Uh, you, you'll see him around. He's been covering the, the UAP bill, going from Congress. And he brought it up to Lou because it does. It, it approaches the phenomena from an interesting point of view. Um, you know, the craft in the book move in a similar way to what we're used to. But it talks about a shadow biosphere, i.e. a world that we can't see because it exists in infrared and various other places like that. And, and the idea is that they're here, but they're not here for us. And actually, we're kind of a, a nuisance on the planet. Um, it's it's a really interesting look at the phenomena. But yeah, there's nothing, you know, Lou isn't kind of giving it with a wink and kind of saying, yeah, this has happened. <laughs> he, he's more giving it as a way to, you know, sci-fi is an amazing way to get people to think about profound problems and issues, but in a really simplistic way. And, and I think that book or that short story does that really well. Yeah, if you've got time, it's worth checking out. Give it a read. It's an interesting take, some interesting opinions, and no doubt some of it may fit in with your own ideas of what are may, not, may or may not be happening with the phenomenon. But I think a good example of that is recently, I can't remember where it was, I saw Lou had commented on Twitter that he was listening to an ACDC song, I think it was, and loads of people started commenting that, what's this got to do with ufos you know what are you trying to say here and i, I don't i don't think it had anything to do with that he was just <laughs> commenting that he liked a particular song uh, and lou was like yeah nothing behind it folks i'm just saying and people were like oh do you mean it's in relation to the task force report or is it in relation to this and it's just like but i suppose it's that that point in lou's he's a celebrity let's be honest that's that's what he is um in, in every way shape and form people are going to do with with his kind of recommendations given on what he knows or we we pertain he knows so that was interesting yeah, but yeah, yeah worth absolutely. checking out change of the sea we, we should also say uh, he, he recommended that, this year three body problem as well which again similar vein it was a recommendation because of how it's discussed and the ideas it talks about because the dark forest theory isn't discussed in any other book as far as i'm con uh, confined um but just google it have a look there's a really cool video by uh, a channel called kyrgyzstat uh, which is it means in a nutshell in German, and it just distills the dark body theory that that book series presents into a really cool, you know, like ten minute video explaining, you know, what it is and the implications for humanity. Dan, can you make a note that we'll put the link for that interview in the description of the show, um, or that um, piece, and we'll, we'll get that up there. I was literally about to say to you um, as you came in there that people have been asking us to share our thoughts and review um, the three body problem, the book. Okay. I I have it. I'm going to read it. I will read it this month. And um, ideally, before you go to Columbia, if we could do a pod just discussing the book and its, its theories and Dark Forest theory. And um, what was really interesting, I, I listened to a podcast called, uh, well, it's a network called Sans Pants Radio. 
and it's a bunch of Australian comedians that do a whole host of different podcasts, and so they're all really funny. I, I really enjoy listening to them. I'm a, I'm a fully paid up member, and they were talking on one of their video game shows about the three body problem uh, because one of the hosts hadn't played any games that week and mentioned he had read the book the three body problem or was halfway through it and he talked about an aspect of the book where there's a video game involved like an interactive experience and they they discussed all those potent they they do talk about ufos now and again but it's quite light-hearted and having a bit of fun with it as a as just a general mystery and they had a really good conversation about it as well um so yeah, that was really interesting and that really prompted me to go, I really have to get this read because if there's Australian comedians who don't have a big interest in UFOs reading the book, I should probably get my ass in gear and do that as well. So <laughs> especially ahead of Netflix commissioning the series, which I apparently was just going to say, you, you want to get in there before the Netflix series comes out. Just, yeah. you know, that it might be wonderful, but it's not going to be the book. There, there will be different things, yeah. you know. Yeah, I promise I'll get that read over the next couple of weeks, folks. It is on my bedside table. Um uh, next up, Joe said, the publication of Harrison Valley's Trinity, The Best Kept Secret. People can check out my interview with Paola Harris on the book. For me, it was one of those, and I think I said at the time, it's it's an interesting case. It was it had a lot of build-up and hype, not necessarily the fault of Paola Harris or Jacques Vallée. People thought the book, given it went up online with, uh, with a cover, then came down was going to be the publication of the metamaterial reports and there'd be some interesting information. And it wasn't that, but that's not their fault. Um, and it turned out to be a, a book about a case that happened before Roswell, a couple of years before. And it probably lacked a lot of really hard-hitting evidence we would look for. What it seemed to have was, was some interesting evidence based on the fact Jacques Vallée, for example, something I really took away from it was he talked about the, or quite controversially, there was a, a picture of a piece that people took to be from inside of a UFO or the, this this downed craft. But it looked like one of our typical joints or a hinge or a bracket that we would use in some old fashioned machinery. And on a recent podcast with George Knapp, Jacques Vallée commented that. Yes, they commented this was apparently from that craft. He didn't say it was a part of the craft, though. What he commented was that it was likely there was American military equipment used in the propping up of the craft and also inside the craft, and this apparently fell off from the inside and was was taken from the craft. So that was a really interesting point that was made by Jacques Vallée, and I, I recommend anyone else, Dan, if you don't mind making a note for me, I'll stick that one in the description as well. I'll find that. It All was right, a, a really <laughs> oh nice. It was a really interesting talk with George Knapp and and Jacques Vallée. But yeah, did did you what did you make of the book? Um, I don't know if you managed to read it in full, but obviously you know the the idea in the story. Yeah, I, I I mean I agree with you. It was a really interesting book about an interesting case. But because the expectation was the peer-reviewed paper that Jack had spoken about for so long, it was just disappointing for that reason. You know, uh, it doesn't mean there's nothing valuable in it. It was still an interesting investigation, um, and the fact that they can prove that this piece of equipment was there, where you know it is in the story of the UFO crash and retrieval, is, is really interesting. You know, it, it's a little bit of a compelling, compelling bit, like the bit of evidence that will keep people pulling that thread. But it wasn't the paper. The paper actually came out um, in December, December 10th. Um, Gary Nolan, Jack Vallée, uh, they were talking about materials. The paper is titled Improved Instrumental Techniques, Including Isotopic Analysis, Applicable to the Characterization of Unusual Materials with Potential Relevance to Aerospace Forensics. You can show rolls that. off the tongue. Yeah, TLDR. We studied UFO materials <laughs> to see if they were <laughs> different. Um, and the paper kind of stands as a as a guide to kind of how to do this in a peer reviewed manner. They, there wasn't necessarily anything anomalous found, but there were some interesting statements in the paper. And again, it's just proof that you can study these materials and put them out to the scientific community and get a peer reviewed response. Um, what the paper didn't cover was the experiences and and you know, the biological effect side of Gary's work. Um, but that was covered in a in a great Vice article about the same time where you spoke about how experiences seem to have more white matter in their brains uh, between the Chordate and the Putman. Um, and and that area is responsible for intuition, which I think is very interesting because we talk a lot about 
um you or, or i do at least you know i change the word intuition out for kind of you know people say psychic powers and i'm like nah it's intuition we're kind of reading something and we can all do it uh so i found that real interesting that, that that's what he found folks if you listen on patreon apple spotify then you're going to hear us carry straight on otherwise if you're on the free feed thank you for checking this out you'll hear us back in one minute after this short advert and we are back dan what was your favorite part of that advert that was played uh it was the the bit with the the advert about the thing you know <laughs> absolutely yeah depending on where you were folks you'll have heard a regional based advert but thank you for, <laughs> for checking that out and if you can support the sponsors uh we roll on with agent black agent black said given it's a marathon of many moving parts and not a sprint i think 2021 is the highlight that's a proper dan cop out political answer that one uh, agent black says i can't pick one moment this year that has stood out for me as everything is connected that said none of these significant events would have happened without the community pulling together Together, whether it was 60 Minutes, Lou Elizondo, The Big Phone Home 2, Ross's book, The Press Club, or the multitude of awesome podcasts. There was also a lot of grassroots work done by Boots on the Ground with a multitude of letters and emails to senators, etc. And I'll add in there people who were writing to, to UK-based uh, politicians, and I'm sure it happened elsewhere in the world as well. So Agent Black wants to pick the community for actively coming together when everything else in the world seemed to be split and divided. It seems we can work together when we focus and choose to do the right thing that's a nice sentiment dan that is a really nice one and i'm going to throw in one of my highlights here because it kind of backs agent black's point uh what, one of my highlights my highlights of the year it didn't happen too long ago so people probably remember it uh we raised twenty four thousand dollars for humane society international and saint jude's children's research hospital it was absolutely incredible to see what the community can do when we come together for something positive positive. and agent black is right you know this year proved that we can move the world if we all put our minds to it yeah that that was incredible and again it's it's not something we're going to do too often folks it's not a case of this month's special charity is because we are here to do shows and talk about ufos and ufo news and speculation that's what we're here for but again next christmas next holiday season we'll, we'll get something together again for for those kind of causes and different charities as well but yeah, yeah. I, I think the community I, i've got to appreciate and shout out because not everyone's on social media but people who are involved with the ufo subject have allowed us to grow this podcast to the level we are at whether that was subscribing to the youtube channel just listening to the the weekly or you know shows every couple of days getting in touch again that, that's been my my favorite thing and i'll give a shout out early this year that if you listen to the podcast and you aren't on social media particularly drop us an email at ufo uap am at gmail.com because uh, i loved hearing from people last year all over the world and how they listen to the podcast and why they listen and just their thoughts and opinions and i've tried my best the last few days to catch up on a lot of correspondence so so yeah the community and anyone who listens to this show particularly it really does mean a lot to myself, and I'm, I'm sure I can say that for Dan as well. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, in, in fact, it's so lovely that I'm just going to give my the signal at protonmail.com out. If anyone wants to say hi, say hi. And um, yeah, like I say, for people to to give their hard on cash for, for Dan to go to Colombia, um, I think next up in March, my wife wants me to do a fundraiser for uh, two weeks to Dubai for me and the family, <laughs> and we'll get that set up. Um <laughs> <laughs> no definitely not but yeah it's it's amazing that you're getting dan out there and we will make sure i will make sure that dan is put to work during his time out there separately from all the work he's going to be doing uh, and creating a lot of content and and getting you know feedback for for you guys on the it might even be like a week of short pods from dan yeah sending me over voice clips of what he's been doing and what's happening just to let everyone know because i, I know dan will feel indebted to everyone that's uh that's donated so it, it really does mean a lot and that community is a good a good shout out 100%. If, if I go, the people are going to be fed up with me live streaming on Instagram about my coffee at the airport and so on and so forth. But we'll have some great conversations along the way. And I'm looking forward to doing some interviews uh, for something that's upcoming. Um, you know, I'll talk to some shamans and things like that. So we'll, we'll get some really, really interesting things out of it, I think. Awesome. Uh, next up is a longtime listener and supporter of the podcast. Big, um, big part of the Discord channel over there as well. Uh, Gnosis and Gnosis said UAPX needs a mention as the more I hear the better it sounds. Uh, I got on really well with Gary Verhees and he's been on the show several times and we're in, in regular contact as well on, on Facebook and Messenger and stuff and I'm, I'm really excited to see what UAPX can bring up. 
I think right now there's a, a ground swell of hype coming out from from over there. They have talked about the you know terabytes of data that could be released, but I could write a ten thousand page book, and only ten of the pages are worth reading. So terabytes of data are great, but is that a whole lot of nonsense to sift through? Is it going to be a real game changer, which it could be? Is it going to be something in between? We don't know at this point, do we, Dan? No. Um, I mean, I, I would put it there with um, with Gary's work. You know, when, when it comes, I feel like it's going to come in a form where we don't have to pour over those three terabytes. They'll already have been analyzed. They'll come with a paper kind of presenting, like, these are the interesting points. But the raw data will be available for us to pour through. And that's kind of what people have always wanted from the Skinwalker Ranch show, right? To kind of really be able to pour through that data. Because some people find going through three terabytes of data boring. Other people absolutely love it. Um, and it's another example where we could come together and, you, you know, all use our unique skills to kind of really help move this course forward. But I think what UAPX has is going to be, it's going to be very exciting. I hope so. And you know what, like we've said, it would be hypocritical to say otherwise, even in all those terabytes of data, if there's one video or one picture or a single frame of a video that warrants a raised eyebrow and there's data to back up, you know, that that could be pretty special and this is this for me uapx could be a platform that leads to other platforms like it launching off as well um but i suppose what you don't want is loads of different organizations and groups and i think we talked about this dan in one of our earlier shows all springing up and diluting what could be a bigger effort put together and a pooling of resources we talked about the galileo project and it's amazing how many people are on board but it's it's hard to tell at this point are those people better working in smaller groups towards one goal or are they all better pulling together but you know what it's like like if we had six hosts on this podcast it would be less of you less of me not that that might not be a bad thing but it's too many voices <laughs> i've always said just personally it's too many voices all on, on at once and if people are listening to an audio podcast with six or seven or eight or ten people all shouting it it dilutes the message and would it be better they have their own separate groups and focuses and own resources we know they've got a you know jeremy mcgowan is a particularly unique vehicle um, that not many people have we know that they are going to have some 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 sailing uh, sailing craft sailing boats things like that and different people on board have different expertise so yeah i'm excited for what uapx brings i hope it's it's positive i'm not expecting disclosure from them or a necessarily a game-changing piece of evidence but if they can contribute something that's really positive then all the better for it uh, and people should support that my my expectation for it, and we can kind of come back to this clip when I see the documentary, if I'm like, oh, God, I was so wrong. Um, my expectation for it is that we're going to see how to get something anomalous, maybe out of the water, and how to film it when that happens. If that's a reliable, you know, data point, we're going to start seeing a lot more data from people just rocking up to Catalina and trying this and getting their own footage, you know? The documentary is called A Ted in the Sky, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And the way to get it out of the water is a fishing rod with plutonium on the end of it. Would that also be correct? Yeah, yeah. You can also throw McWest in the water and they'll come right out because, you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be surfing on top of a Tic Tac. <laughs> um, yeah, so next up, thanks for that one, Gnosis. Uh, yeah, UAPX, big shout out. And I've said before, if people can search Gary Voorhees on YouTube, Gary was looking to up his subscribers so he could do more lives as well. And that that's something Gary Voorhees should have over a thousand subscribers. If we've got six and a half thousand, then Gary deserves more. So please go and Definitely. follow Gary Voorhees on YouTube. Um, Jay says, this podcast aside, thanks very much, Jay. I didn't add that in myself. I'd say lose interviews with Kurt and the Ross Coulter interviews, they capture attention. Reminds me of listening to George Knapp when he's telling a story. It's engrossing. It's a frustrating topic overall. And yeah, short and sweet that one, but it is a frustrating topic. But Dan, even without the UAP office that may or may not come into existence, without all the governmental stuff, you know, we could do a year is worth of shows on other cases and books and movies yeah. and ideas and speculation we've just been very lucky that in the last year there's been so much to talk about from a, a current news point of view and if indeed that does slow down over the next few months that we kind of expect we've got a whole lot of things we can talk about and that might be a nice uh, welcome change of pace anyway for us but 
yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this year, and it might not be the worst thing if we have a few months of of less news coming out from the from the office, and it it drops with more of a bigger bang for for me. Um, but yeah, that that's anything to add to that one. I just to, I mean that that's the second time we've mentioned Kurt now, so I just want to give props to him. You know, he's come, he's bulldozed into this subject with an open mind. And, you know, people talk about Eric Weinstein and his approach, and it's amazing that he's come to the subject, but they both admit their ignorance in the subject. You know, it's not an insult to be called ignorant. It just means you don't know. If you decide not to learn at that point, that makes you willfully ignorant. That is an insult. Um, Whereas these guys, you know, they admit their ignorance and they're here to listen and learn with us. And I think that's really important. And they set a great example. Absolutely. We got some nice comments in um, that were Melanie um, couldn't pick a favourite and then said all our shows have been thought provoking, insightful and downright great. So thank you, Melanie. Dahlia said uh, her highlight was personal. Uh, she discovered earlier this year that she saw what she was pretty sure was the Phoenix Lakes, except she was in Elfrida, Arizona. It was a group sighting and she had completely forgotten about it, which is super weird because she's been into UFOs her whole life. Pretty cool to think I was part of that strange moment in history. So yeah, that's that's a cool one, Dad. Very cool, yeah. Um, and Jean said, for me, it was reading Ross Coulthard's book and your interviews with him. A roundtable of authors would be something that interests me. A roundtable of podcasters on the subject as well. So yeah, good shout, good idea, something to look into. Do you know what can be really hard just on that is, and I loved getting the surveys back from people and, you know, people will say, oh, I wish why, you should have done two hours with Ross or you should have done three hours with Lou. And I, I would love to go that long with any of the guests that we have but um, people tend to be quite limited in the time that they have. And especially when people are doing a media run, they might have five interviews on that day. Um, We try and catch people when they're on their own and it's maybe a little bit later or a bit earlier just to get a bit of a different interview out of them. But yeah, for for me, um, getting some of those people together on one podcast would be would be outstanding. Um, And maybe that's something we can look into this year because I've not done a round table for a while. So um. Yeah, that could be that could be worth them um, looking into. Yeah, I think that would be excellent. Um, Ross started a podcast with Bryce Zabel uh, in December yes. as well called Need to Know. I'd recommend everyone check that out. It's just them kind of discussing, you know, what you heard Ross discuss and, and Bryce Zabel um, directed Dark Skies and a whole host of uh, UFO content. And he's, I think he's currently working on a Betty and Barney Hill adaptation. Um, so he knows his stuff too. Um, they, there's My favorite piece of his is on John Lennon's UFO sighting. And you can find that on uh, medium.com. I'd recommend just have a Google, have a read of it. it it's quite a stunning sighting, um, especially to come from John Lennon. Dan, make a note. We'll stick that one in the, the description of Dan. the podcast <laughs> as well. That was something people asked us to do more of. And I do try and write them down as we as we go along. So we'll get those in there for people as well. We are trying to get better and a bit tighter with that kind of stuff this year, folks. Um, Katie says, for me, one of the major highlights was definitely the Galileo project. Just love the ideas and attitude of leader Avi Loeb. Scientists are finally on the case and the research will be public. I'm really excited about the research we will see in our lifetime from this project and all the brilliant minds associated with it in addition the uap task force report in june and the recent amendments to the defense bill for sure is avi loeb the leader of that organization i mean yeah pretty much um <clears throat> there are a number of people involved but he's the founder of the project um along with the guy who gave him that initial capsule i forget the gentleman's name now uh, but i know he was anonymous for a while so my, my brain's still kind of blanking he, he's listed on the research page and avi wrote a an article about how the galileo project came to be um so i would credit those two guys with kind of running and owning the thing yeah do you know what fair enough he's the head of the galileo project yeah i couldn't remember the exact title but on the on the main page it's head of the galileo project that was the one i know avi's one of those people that probably wouldn't like to be labeled something that he isn't so uh but yeah fair enough if he's the head he's the head um and you know what he's a great guy to do that i seen some criticism of of avi um online recently and again it was only a couple of people but they were commenting on a few podcasts or shows that avi had gone on to um Again, I don't think it matters if they have huge audiences or, or small audiences, but people commented that there's a lot of conspiracy theorists on as guests on some of those shows and that Avi shouldn't be doing those types of shows. But for me, I think it shows, one, that Avi's happy to go on podcasts with two or three hundred people or two or three million as his, he was a guest on this podcast when there was only a couple of 
maybe a couple of thousand people listening, which is amazing. But earlier this year, the week after he was on Joe Rogan. So, you know, that's that's a, a hell of a difference in, in podcasting terms for that Joe Rogan to this podcast. And Avi was happy to sit and do equally both of those. Um which which is amazing for for people like myself and other podcasters. So I think it's a good sign that no matter the quality or or guest reach of any show, that Avi is willing to go on there and talk about the subject and and get the message out there regardless. So I, I can only see that as a positive. But I, I appreciate people might be guarded or defensive of Avi's message and status and, you know, how he's seen by other members of the public. But again, it just goes to show he's he's the one that's getting this um, difficult time from his peers and colleagues, as we've seen in different interviews and that got leaked online uh, because of what he's talking about and how he's talking about it. He's being ridiculed from within. Um, so it speaks a lot to the man that he's willing to go on to other shows and podcasts and TV interviews and, and talk about this in such a public way. So you've you've got to say more power to him for that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, science is something to inspire people with, not to lock behind the door and close people's minds over and say, you know, don't don't look the, down the telescope um, and change our paradigm. Um, Avi's not afraid to do that. You know, the name's very fitting, Project Galileo. Um, and Avi wants to inspire people to join efforts like this and start looking because there are goddamn miracles out there in the universe and you just have to look. That's it. <laughs> Dan, on the spot, uh, what are you expecting from Project Galileo this year? So I would expect kind of, I'll be a little conservative. You know, I don't think we're going to get a picture of a, of a gray kind of throwing the peace sign out a window. Um, I, I think we'll probably start seeing the data flow in. The analysis will probably start in the second half of this year. But once they make this initial sensor kit and roll it out and they know it's working it's just a case of replicating those efforts so i think by the end of 2022 we'll have a lot of them at different points all over the planet awesome yeah i'm excited for galileo project and it's it's interesting that we've got the james webb going up and looking way out and we've got the galileo project that's based on the earth but again looking a little bit closer than where james webb's going to be looking relatively speaking and we have UAPX who are based here and looking very much at our oceans and our skies and and a few other projects and whatnot along the way as well. So I think we're starting to cover bases that we've never really had covered all at once. And again, if these groups and organizations could could speak to each other, that, that can only be beneficial, I'm sure, as well. So a yeah. lot to look forward to there. The, the James Webb was one of my highlights this year. I, I sat watching it on Christmas morning. Uh, I love seeing I Mission Control yeah. celebrate after it goes off without a hitch. You know, it's just all those people work so hard on this for so long. And it's an incredible feat of engineering and the teamwork. But it's going to be looking at the IR kind of spectrum, near and mid. Um, and it'll be able to kind of, you know, if there's, say, for example, it was looking at Earth from bajillion miles away. Um, it would be able to see the emissions from our cars, from our homes, from the lights, you know, things like that. Um, so things like, I don't know if you remember Tabby's star, where it was dimming and they thought it might be a Dyson sphere around the star. And they kind of kept looking and kept looking and they think it's space dust now. With that, we'll just be able to look at it. And it, instead of the, if it is space dust, we there, there are certain signs that will show that in infrared, as opposed to actually seeing a, a full power output um, of a star being dimmed by the amount that the guy who kind of, came up with the idea of Dyson Spheres. His whole work was how to find it with IR. And that's what they're doing now. So it's very cool. It's uh, potentially amazing. Dan, realistically, uh, James Webb goes up and it's unfurling its uh, shield just now, I think, still. Yeah, that's um, right. Is that right? The, the sun field's um, deployed, but I think it's not tensioned at the moment. Okay. Come March or April, and it's it's been fully up and running for a little while, and it's starting to to get images and gather data. It, say it picks something up that's pretty remarkable. It picks up a planet somewhere, and it manages to see you know a uh, city's lights or uh, an odd chemical composition in an atmosphere. Or do you think we're going to get that reported straight back to the public though? No, it, it'll be like the Venus phosphine thing where they took a number of years to kind of go through it. The peer review process happened. It wasn't until they had, um, scientists refer to it as like Sigma 5, Sigma 6. It means that, you know, 
beyond a reasonable doubt this is what we're looking at it's how certain they are the higher the number the better basically um and they've actually just looked over those phosphine results from venus again and there's a mission that will get there i think it's in 2023 or maybe it's launching then um but these little bits of data just prompt us to look more intensely so you know the the james webb telescope where we're there at the moment thinking oh yeah it'll have some cool ir pictures it might find life on another planet so on and so forth it might find something we don't even know exists right now and have no idea about at all um and and that's super exciting I think it's only fitting to finish off from a listener's point of view with uh, Dave Smethurst, who has been in regular touch with both of us. It was great to meet him back at the UFO Minicon in Preston. And uh, I'm sure we'll be meeting up again a couple of times this year. And Dave commented that obviously his highlight of the year was the UAP report acknowledging UFO reality and tech we don't understand, closely followed by the Gillibrand Amendment being approved as part of the NDAA. Assuming that it's most people's choice, another big highlight was Lou, alluding to our DNA potentially being altered and our history not being how it's written on Cut Dry Mungo's show, later backed up by John Ramirez. Mind-blowing and plot thickening. Yeah, so again, Dave comments on a few of the, the, the well-known ones we've talked about there, but regarding the DNA alterations, that was something new that, that came out this year from Lou. Um I think, I think that, that was the Kurt interview as well, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he was saying, yeah. I think something that I'm going to do, uh, hopefully this month or so, is um, actually, nope, I'll keep that to myself because, yeah, I will, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I will get your DNA tested. Are we going to see if you're reptilian? Yes, new no sponsor 23 and Me on the podcast. Is, <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a really good segue into that. But no, that is not a sponsor. Um, but yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll keep that one to myself and I'll sort it. But yeah, that was a really interesting comment. And to be fair, I think John Ramirez as a personality and character is very different to Lou. Um, if yeah, Lou, not not the same. No, but then again, if if Lou came out as he is now, and imagine in one interview talked about all the things that he has over the last couple of years, do you think he would be seen differently? because he wouldn't have then had a couple of years of much slower build-up and drip feed of information. And he talks about, you know, disclosure being like the tap dripping, dripping, dripping. But Lou's kind of done that himself with what he's talked about. And do you think that's maybe why someone like John Ramirez, if he'd come out and been a little bit more reserved at first and built up to talk about what he's talking about, would have been seen a bit differently? probably for, for me it was how john presented it you, you know in in project unity's interview with him there was a whole section of his presentation called speculation and the more interviews john did the more that speculation word dropped from what he was talking about um i i love the organizational stuff that john talks about how how the different offices work what data they have how you foyer them i think that's really interesting um but once we get to the patches and then be in a secret way to tell the world that reptilians run the world. You know, there's there's esoteric symbolism on the patches I make. I don't know. I have any secret inside knowledge that you know there's a we all have a real third eye and so so on and so forth. And you know, it's just it's it's just conjecture and speculation. I. I, in the editing mm. process, might cut out that you said I don't have any secret knowledge and I'll just take the word don't out and it's just going to be you saying I have secret <laughs> knowledge that we have a third eye and that could get people talking. Yeah, it would get people talking. But that that's the difference between him and Lou, I think. When Lou gets to that level of speculation, he says, you know, I'm, I'm not going to speculate or this is my opinion. Um, and I don't really feel like he'd ever go that far on that tenuous a level of evidence. That's um, everything for listeners' comments. We're going to finish off with our highlights, Dan. I'm going to throw one in here, though, that I didn't plan on doing, but I think we can discuss quickly because something came up as you were discussing. And I suppose one of my lowlights of the year is something you mentioned earlier. And thinking back, there's been a whole lot happened. And this is a roller coaster. There's ups and downs, and it'll happen again this year, folks. If you think it's going to be a, a nice, easy journey to the UFO office being set up, it's set up and then we get weekly briefings dropping on YouTube from from someone running that program. That's not going to happen. But something I was really excited for, and given the person involved and attached and the, the production values, was the J.J. Abrams UFO series. And I thought, 
given the timing of it just after the report had come out and JJ Abrams as a director um having a lot of you know respect and and everything else I thought that could be pretty groundbreaking um I thought this could be the phenomenon times 10 and for the mainstream and for the general not that the the phenomenon documentary by James Fox isn't for the mainstream but wow sticking that was it on HBO Max yeah that's right yeah um I th- and it's on Sky over here in the UK. I think you can still get it on demand. I thought that could have been a real game changer for public perception. And instead, it seemed that they they had a good idea and had some good intentions. They didn't have enough content for four episodes, but decided to go with four episodes anyway and decided to do two good episodes and then two really poor speculative episodes that just took away all the good work done in those first two and for me that was a real disappointment yeah um i i totally thought you were going to say something different by the way i wrote down <laughs> what, what did you what did you, you what did you think i was going to say uh i thought you were going to say what would be my low light of the year we'll start with low well, lights because the, the bad news I'm, first. I'm, yeah I'm, go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you your low light anyway yeah yeah um and jolly and that whole mess i i feel like that was very exemplary of the 80s and 90s kind of ufology stuff that we got used to and just as always this stuff turns out to be nonsense you you know people people find it more glitty and shiny because she uses is you know some more uh she dramatizes the concept but ultimately it comes down to someone sat on social media saying that she's going to go meet 5d beings in a cave and i just want to give her a hug and ask if she's okay you know yeah and i think we covered that quite a bit so i won't go on about it myself but yeah I can't disagree with that one um, on you. Um, it turned out exactly as most of us, unfortunately, thought it was going to. And again, I, I don't think I have to stress this at this point, this podcast going into its third year now, or 18, 19 months of, of content. And I've always been really honest and tried to just show both sides of the coin. And I've said that I would love every video, every piece of footage, every interview to to really push things forward and be 100% truthful and be fascinating and all the videos and footage that get sent to me or I see online to all be 100% true, non-human exotic technology and they're not. It's just it's just the nature of this subject. It's not how it, a subject and it's not how it works and that was one that straight from the off, like you say, it was only going to go one way and it's exactly how it happened. I'm I'm still amazed that it's still kind of going though. Um, I no longer follow that account. Uh, I'll just say that much though. So. Yeah, I, I mean, well, one interesting thing came from it, I guess, that that I was put into that vote thing to go to mm. the exhibition, and now it's not to the exhibition to the uh, what's the word I'm looking for expedition, the not expedition. Expedition. exhibition. Yeah, not being displayed. Um, yeah, the, the now I might actually be going on a on a legit expedition somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. We could have sent you there instead, but yeah, I think I think you're you're going to something a little bit more credible. Um, but yes, highlight of the year, Dan. You've you've talked about a few of them. Um, have you got a standout highlight for twenty twenty one? Yeah, and and you're you you might go red faced here because it was our visit to London where I got to meet you, Graham, Dave, <clears throat> Vinny, um, and Ryan on the Friday, and then Lou on the Saturday. That for me that whole section like i know you're real anyway there's no debate in that in my head you know you're not catfishing me on the side of the side of the screen there but there was a moment in london where it suddenly got a bit more real for me you know and and now i find myself often just sat at the sky thinking you know they're they're out there doing their thing and people are arguing over whether they even exist or not it reminds me of uh, don't look up if, if anyone has seen that um but yeah, come, coming away from that meeting with Lou, every, everything had gotten super real for me. And especially the the friendships that we forged over social media and Instagram. And it was an absolute pleasure to meet everybody and to to kind of start stepping in to, to this subject that's going to become a lot more uh, robust research-wise. That was actually one of my lowlights, um, but I, cho- I chose to leave it. <laughs> I chose to leave it specifically out. when I no, went to um, you in slow motion. I'm guessing. Absolutely, yeah. Um, no, London. London was a great time, and like I say, people 
not not people some people online made it out to be something it wasn't and super secret meetups and all that kind of stuff and thanks for thinking of us so highly but that's definitely not what it was uh yeah and and you know what this year we do plan hopefully on getting a couple of meetups happening in the uk um officially or unofficially if it's at one of the other conferences that are happening um there's one in blackpool we know in june i think we're all planning on attending that uh, as a group and that's not you know we're not meeting up and having some super secret meetup and we'll probably be in a bar somewhere and people are more than welcome to come along and join us if that's going to be the case and blackpool is quite central in the uk but yeah meeting meeting people for me was a big one you guys obviously um meeting listeners that the walking up to the ufo minicon in preston uh, but it was put on by ash and everyone um and helping out very last minute with that but as i approached the venue in the car seeing someone with your t-shirt on dan was really really weird because it's oh yeah that was that was really odd i think i sent you a picture straight away but just getting to talk to to like barry and dave and nick and frank from ufo thinker pod and stuff there and ash and and anyone else was was really really cool um that was that was a lot of fun um but my my highlight as pertains to the whole subject um is is the new people that got involved um ross coulthart has been mentioned ad nauseum here cut dry mungle uh, eric weinstein and a whole load of others like that who are now taking the subject very seriously themselves as and that includes senators congressmen and women and any other politicians worldwide who might be doing this it's it's not that i don't care about their politics previously and people would get in touch and say this person voted for this bill three years ago and this person got involved with this and yeah i'm I'm sure they did but purely from a ufo point of view and moving this conversation forward that it's been good um and it's been great to see those from outside the mainstream really have that impact that i hope they carry on and, and take forward in 2022 it'll be great to see people like kurt jai mungal who isn't a ufo guy although i know dan you've said previously that when you look at him the amount of interviews he's now done and the 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 interest he has he kind of is but i'm sure kurt would say that he's he's just someone with a, an interest in a lot of different areas of life and the more that continues the better um i i want to see rogan do more interviews again on the subject this year i want to see lou on rogan i'd love to see ross coulter on on rogan and those other big big podcasts and british television news channels that's that's what i want to carry on because that could only make a massive difference to the subject i think for me in getting that credibility if if we don't get any more in the way of evidence this year which we've got to say is a possibility although I, I still think we'll get s- something if we don't get any more evidence that that pushes forward those three videos or, or otherwise i think if you could just turn up the noise and the volume on what happened in 2021 to a bigger public setting could be huge and that's going to help other scientists and journalists get involved in this topic as well because i think what brought things down with a bump maybe for some people yesterday from a uk point of view and this is where people ask us to uh, what's happening in the uk and we should do like a a uk big phone home and it's like no we're still so 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 far away from that unless something drastically changed one of the newspapers here yesterday dan you saw the headline was about a percentage of youngsters in the uk still believe that lizards run the country that was a front page and it's, it's a bit of a rag it's a tabloid and a really rough tabloid but that's still where we're at in the UK with a lot of this subject and it's still a fight but I suppose it was a really nice kind of juxtaposition on the same day that was a headline for the Daily Star about lizard people running the UK and then at night we had Channel 5 putting on a really nice nicely toned and serious documentary on the UFO subject for the public so still mixed messages but I think there's a lot of positive signs there for for going forward into 2022. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I'm just going to touch on our work with the Sun with UAP Media because I think it's it, it's pertinent to what you were saying here. Um, a few a few days back, <clears throat> um, part part of what we do at UAP Media is we work with journalists to kind of inform them properly and to try and help them get the tone of the piece right. Because if the person doesn't know about it, then how can they be expected to get a tone that's respectable? You know, and I spent the day helping kind of get an article out via the Sun, and the headline came out. Uh, with the word alien hunters at the end. And I remember we all, everyone cringed in the group and I was very like, well, you know, all news is good news. But I simply went back to the journalist 
we spoke about it and then he deleted the jokes and the alien hunters word and it's a really good example of all i did was message him and i was kind and i just said hey look you know uap doesn't necessarily mean alien um let's talk about this properly and the headline got changed so i recommend just when you see things like that like the daily mail thing or the daily star sorry like engage those people if they aren't covering it properly engage them and talk to them this is how lou and kurt started talking literally we i i would watch kurt's channel and he was incredible he was a really really cool thinker so i emailed and asked if he wanted to speak to lou and again everything that's come from that and the conversations inspiring people to get involved is is amazing because that's the like you said if we can get more volume more people know there's more awareness and we can tackle it properly and that's what's important going forward this year i think yeah i remember in the group chat dan i was i was pretty level-headed wasn't i when i saw the alien hunters comment and um i'm sure you basically quoted me when you spoke to the journalist and and said this is what andy says so (laughs) um i was completely level-headed wasn't i in my response to that but no you you dealt with it very well and it was it was good to see the the journalists in question were, were happy to change that and what i would hope is not for that article but for the next one that it's not even a thought for them Agreed. and that we don't have to correct any language and that's not to say where we want people's opinions to be our opinions that they should be their own but it would just be nice that if the first thought that came to their mind wasn't alien hunters rejoice yeah and that no, it was no you know jokes you know yeah that that's it yeah and, if, and if, this was, that's... if this was chinese drones jokes wouldn't even enter into their heads right so it should be at least that level i think yeah and if people want to check out uapmedia.uk or follow at uap media online the links for those will be in the the show description as well but they're very available on social media channels and that's a group with uh, myself dan dave partridge Vinny adams adam goldsack and graham rendo um doing a lot of really really good work on there as well those guys so that's just from a uk point of view trying to really help and change the conversation and so much of the work uap media does is in the background folks like i say people wouldn't have known that unless dan had said but yes dan did do that reach out to a journalist of which we're speaking to many journalists now and trying to have those conversations that when they are putting this work out that it's more representative of people like you who listen to this show, your thoughts, your opinions, and you're not going to be embarrassed reading it or associating with it either. So yeah, that's, that's the kind of work going on there. When I spoke to those guys in the morning, um, they weren't even aware that Biden had signed the NDAA. So we essentially managed to sneak in with the UAP angle before a political article, article was written. But it just goes to show, just speak to people. You never know. This is what Tom did to get this whole thing started. Go knock the door, be a loud mouth, you know, be a bull in the china shop absolutely and just to finish off folks like i say give you ap media a follow make sure you're following dan online myself online subscribing to the podcast anything you can do to help out is much appreciated and spreading the word sharing the news getting involved engaging the conversation if and if it's speaking to friends of yours and colleagues at work as the new year kicks off and you bring up there or they bring up the conversation of aliens or ufos just have that chat with them um change the conversation and just what if ask them that question the you know the what if it's something like this or what if it's this or have you heard about the the us and what the the work that's being done in government there or you know changing attitudes all around recommend some books recommend some documentaries if you're you're stuck for that then just give us a shout online and we're more than happy to point you in those those right directions as well but i i would emphasize that people should be socially aware if you see that glazed look in the person you're speaking to's eyes stop and back away come back to them another time let them think on what you've said absolutely and just one last reminder folks you might have heard with new podcasts coming on the network i don't want to clog up the that ufo podcast feed with loads of new shows you will see some of those appear on the feed though in january including disclosure teams podcast uh, the quantum witch cafe shows and dan's new podcast will be kicking off this month it's gonna be exciting Yes, I'm looking forward to that. And also Dave and Graham's historical UFO deep dives, with the idea being that from February, they will have their own feed and it will be on the Anomalous Podcast Network. So if you follow on Twitter at Anomalous Podnet, again, link in the description, then that'll be great. There'll be lots more announcements on there. I'll get the Instagram up and running. Dan, at some point this year, is going to do the logo for that as well, which will be appreciated. Probably December, good, like first week of December yeah cool. first week of december you'll start asking me what i'm looking for again <laughs> um, but the idea being that that network will have those types of shows that are going to give you different opinions different conversations different voices all discussing this subject 
and the phenomenon in general from a lot of different angles. So I really hope people um, support us on that and appreciate you checking it out, sharing it, listening, and uh, just dipping your toe in the water for those conversations. Am I, um, am I allowed to share the name of my my show? Nope. No? <laughs> um, so actually, yes, you can, yeah, because we've not said anything yet. It's your show, so yeah, feel cool. free. So so the way I described the show to Andy was essentially like the main the main show is an amazing kind of us doing a balancing beam act, kind of talking about nuts and bolts and some weirder things as well. Uh, but people probably noticed that I skew a bit weirder than Andy does. Um, so my show is essentially going to be me jumping off that balance beam, going into the woods to see what's there, and then coming back. Um and it's going to be called Coloring Outside the Lines. So look for the first episode of that in the next four weeks. And Dave Partridge and Graham Rendell's podcast, I'll, I'll let you know now, is going to be called the Unidentified Aerial Podcast. And they'll be doing historical deep dives into UFO cases, you know, right back from the 30s, 40s, 50s and, and onwards as well. And honestly, some of the stuff they have put in our private chat that they are working on for this is is amazing. And I, I'm really looking forward to, to that. And like I said, Dan and I could put on those pods. We wouldn't do them justice. No. So we'll leave that to two two people I can truly say are professionals in that manner. Um, really, really proud and happy to see Vinnie Adams' Disclosure Team podcast, which you can check out on Instagram and YouTube. Those will be available on audio format on this podcast too, um, at Anomalous Podnet. And also Priscilla's Quantum Witch Cafe interviews will be up there. She's just done a really great one with Christina Gomez that is well worth checking out as well. So a lot of good stuff to come and very excited for this new venture. Just to reiterate though, folks, I know a few people were worried that UFO podcast shows aren't changing, aren't going anywhere. There'll still be the interviews, there'll still be the breakdowns of myself and Dan. And like I say, there's a few shows, ideas that people have asked us to do, and we'll be bringing those to you as well. I'll, Like I say, I've promised, and I will go back and delete this in a month's time if I've not done it, that um, we'll, we'll get the review of the three-body problem out there as well, and we'll discuss and speculate on that too. Other people do UFO book clubs, so it's not one that we plan on starting up, but we'll just be discussing that particular book and some of the ideas within it as well. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Again, folks, Dan, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, everyone have a fantastic new year. I, I hope you all have what you truly need given to you. Absolutely. And make sure you check out the next interview, interview to drop on the podcast on the free feeds with Ashley Cowie, TV presenter, documentary filmmaker, and soon to be friend of Dan's out in Colombia. <laughs> That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, UAP, AM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditative game of state full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. I helped out my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And they think I should see therapy. And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me.
Thank you.